together. But uh, it's nice to see everybody. How are you guys? I feel great. tall. I feel tall today. This is great. Yeah, you you do look a little bit tall today. You you, you do absolutely look a little bit tall today. I ate a lot of shabbos. <sighs> They say the camera usually adds 10 pounds. What is it in inches that the camera adds? We'll check on the wide shot. We'll see if we can notice a difference. <laughs> uh, so I, so we're a little bit earlier today. Uh, so the question is why? why? Why are we earlier today? And I think it has to do with our guest. Uh, uh, we have a guest coming from, uh, from Israel joining us. Uh, and uh, she is in the midst of getting her life together at the end of the day in Israel and very graciously made some time for us. Even though I'm sure things in her uh, in her world are a little bit hectic right now, so we moved the program up a little bit. Rabbi Lichter, who is our guest today? We have uh, what a distinct privilege to be hosting uh, Mrs. Brooke Goldstein. Um, she she's actually somebody. I don't know if you guys remember pre-pandemic, uh, we had her slated to pre-pandemic. That feels like twelve years ago. Yeah, <laughs> we we had her scheduled to come. Uh, to speak for Shabbos in Shul it was going to be a great Shabbos, um, and uh, and then the pandemic hit, and it was it was challenging. Um, if I if my if my memory serves me correctly, I think she gave birth as well right around that time. She was going to come when she was like eight months pregnant. She was going to do the whole thing. It would have been uh, incredible. So uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, could have had another great baby, back. right? Sorry, birth in Great Neck. We could have had another Great Neck baby. Adam. Another, another Great Neck baby. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. Well, Barbara, I'm glad that it worked out. Uh, that it worked out for her, uh, and worked out for us now that we get to have her here. Yeah, that's um, fantastic. Uh, dinner, is she is she with us yet? She is ready. She is smiling at the camera, waiting to come in. All right, okay. let's bring her in. Hello there. Uh, how are you, Brooke Goldstein? Nice to have you with us. Thank you for having me. I'm so, glad we were able to make it happen. It's yes. a pleasure to have you, and thank you for being so accommodating that you're able to uh, to join us. I'm sure things are a little bit hectic for you. Uh, we we were just discussing. Everybody, right? Yes, we were just discussing this uh, this new baby that you had, mm -hmm. right? Right around the time you were supposed to come here, a boy or girl? A boy. Thank God I had a beautiful, healthy boy in the middle of the pandemic. Wow. Um, we're, you know, it was nerve-wracking, obviously, but now we're on the other side and we're in Israel right now. We were planning to be in Israel before, um, and so eventually we made it. And um, it's really, I have to say, a, a great place to be to wait this stuff out. Aruch Hashem. Wow. Did you always have plans for Aliyah? I've always wanted to get Israeli citizenship. Uh, it was definitely a priority for me and my husband, and it was something that we've been putting off for quite some time. And now that the kids are out of school and it seems like we have nothing but time, it, it was it's the right thing to do. Great move, great move, smart That's move. Cool. We can't even tell us now. So you're there. It's you have to be our representative for a little while. And I have to say that it was. You know, I always thought that as a diaspora Jew, you know, Israel would always be a place that I could very readily go to if, God forbid, something happened. And with the closure of the borders with COVID, um, it, it alarmed me a little bit because actually Israel's borders are closed, like every other country's borders are closed to non-citizens. Um, so that to me was a big wake up call and really the impetus that let us apply for citizenship that, and of course we want to uh, be a part of this great country. Amazing. Are you in Jerusalem or are you somewhere in the suburbs? We're in Tel Aviv. In Tel Aviv, the suburbs of Jerusalem. Very nice. <laughs> very, very nice to hear. And we're really grateful. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we would love to have you in person. We'd actually love to have all of us in person, but at least for the time being, that's not going to happen. Although perhaps we see a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I look forward to seeing you in Mir Hashem on the streets of, uh, of Tel Aviv and uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. Uh, Brooke, what got you into this world of anti-Semitism, the Lawfare Project? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, how far back do we want to go? <laughs> Grade school, whatever you want to, wherever you want to start. So I grew up in Toronto, Canada. My grandparents actually, and my mom grew up in Little Neck, very close to oh. your synagogue. And we've been to your synagogue when I was a little girl. Wow. 
there is that connection there. Um, and I grew up in a Zionistic household where I was taught the value of Jewish pride, uh, the uniqueness of our history. I was sent to Bialik Hebrew Academy. Um, so I was given a Hebrew education. And um, being Jewish was always very central to my identity, something that I was very proud of, as well as my connection to the Jewish state. And that's all because of my parents and the education that I got. Um, and then I went to law school and I ended up producing a documentary film called The Making of a Martyr. Uh, I started filming when I was 24 years old and uh, it stopped filming about 25 and a half, took a year and a half of my life with my co-producer, Alistair Leyland, that I met in McGill. And filming the documentary really opened up my eyes. Um, the documentary was about, or is about, the recruitment, the illegal state-sponsored recruitment of innocent Muslim children towards violence. And the message as a young law student that I was trying to make with this movie is that uh, Palestinian Muslim children, like children anywhere else in the world are innocent and they do not deserve to be taught to seek their own death, to seek martyrdom. And this is a human rights violation, you know, like any other violation targeting the children, whether it's recruitment of children for child soldiers or recruitment of children to become suicide homicide bombers, it's the same thing. And yet the politicization of the issue of the so-called Israeli-Palestinian conflict has prevented people from looking at this from a civil rights perspective, from a human rights perspective. And above all, the child is innocent. And if there is to be a future of peace, then we, it has to start with the children. So filming that documentary, I think, is what launched my career in, in the world of counterterrorism, human rights law, uh, and so forth. And after that, um, I ended up working as in-house counsel for the Middle East Forum under Daniel Pipes, who taught me everything I know about Islamism and, and those types of political movements. And I ended up running a litigation defense fund with him, where we funded and found pro bono counsel for the legal defense of those in the counterterrorism community or moderate Muslim community who were sued for speaking out against radical Islam or on issues of national security. And it was there that I learned the concept of lawfare, the use of the law as a weapon of war and how that's being used against not just the Jewish community, but also against the West and how millions and millions of dollars were going towards a litigation offensive targeting our free speech, targeting the Jewish community and so forth. And so after that experience, and I'll sum it up with this. I wanted to work for the Jewish Civil Rights Litigation Fund. After all, I spent all this time you know, in the defense. I wanted to go on the offense. So I fortuitously met a gentleman that you probably all know, Mr. Malcolm Holmline, who was head of Conference of Presidents. And I said to Mr. Holmline, I'm looking for a job. I want to work for, for a Jewish Civil Rights Litigation Fund. And he said to me, there is none. You start it. Wow. allowed me to sublet an office from his face and thus was born the Lawfare Project, which remains to this day the only Jewish civil rights litigation fund in the world with over 400 attorneys who have dedicated themselves to working pro bono or reduced rate on groundbreaking cases to enforce the civil rights of the Jewish community throughout the globe. So we're not just talking about the United States or Israel, we're talking about literally around the world. Right, mostly in, in the West, I should say. We have filed, oh my God, right now, almost 100 cases in, I think it's about 18 different jurisdictions around the world within the last three years. Uh, we have managed to have over, what is it now, $7 million of pro bono legal support donated to the Jewish community. And I think uh, enforce and, and affect some major change in various spaces, whether it's the campus space, whether it's the workplace, whether it's issues of commercial discrimination, which is what BDS is, we've attacked the problem through the law because it really is our belief and, and I know that the truth and the law is on our side. And so we must do what other minority communities have been doing already for decades, which is engage in impact litigation, litigation that is aimed to uphold and enforce the civil rights of our community as a minority community in the West. It's an amazing thing, just an amazing thing. 
Can you can you share with us some of your most memorable cases? Just one or two. So they're all memorable, um, but I would say I will share two or three of what I think are the most impactful cases when it comes to securing protection for the Jewish community. Um, the first was the lawsuit that we filed against San Francisco State University. Um, San Francisco State University is considered ground zero for the anti-Jewish campus movement. Uh, not many people know that Yasser Arafat himself through, flew to San Francisco in the 1970s and established something called GUPS, the General Union of Palestinian Students at SFSU, at San Francisco State, which then became um, Students for Justice in Palestine. Mm -hmm. And everything from Israeli Apartheid Week to the you know BDS resolutions, they're all started in the San Francisco area and then the lessons are learned and then imported to, to campuses or exported to campuses throughout the country. So at San Francisco State University, Jewish students were being intentionally excluded from campus programming, the Hillel, which is the only Jewish and non-political uh, Jewish student group on campus, was denied the ability to table at a Know Your Rights Fair when everybody else was invited. Events that were being put on, specifically the event with the former Jerusalem mayor, Nir Barkat, was shut down by an angry mob threatening violence. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the Lawfare Project was retained by students and community leaders and we ended up filing a groundbreaking civil rights lawsuit against San Francisco State University, alleging First Amendment violations, Title VI civil rights violations, discrimination, and so forth. We ended up settling that lawsuit, what I think is a really important settlement. Uh, in that settlement, the California State University system, which is the party that we sue, which is the umbrella system for SFSU and other California State University uh, campuses, CSU agreed for the first time, okay, a government entity agreed for the first time to recognize Zionism as an integral part of the Jewish identity. Now, why is that important? Because what we're seeing right now on campuses is the intentional discrimination and harassment and hostility targeting Jewish students because they're Jewish, but using the excuse of, well, we're targeting you not because you're Jewish, but because you're anti-Zionist. And Zionism is a political point of view, therefore it's not a protected category under the anti-discrimination law. Well, this is false, and we proved it to be false, and we solidified this in the settlement agreement because in fact, and Elisa Liu and of course of the Brandeis Center does a wonderful job uh, expanding on this. Zionism is an integral part, not only of our national identity, but of our ethnic identity, our cultural identity, as much a part of being Jewish as is doing the Shabbat, lighting the Shabbat candles, for example. We pray facing Jer Jerusalem. Um, all of our, a uh, lot of our, as you would know, Rabbi, the um, uh, religious observations are centered around Jerusalem. I think how many mitzvot are required to be done only in Jerusalem and so forth. And on top of that, the yearning of Zionism is an expression of our basic civil right to self-sovereignty. So if you go to a Jewish student who was born in America and you deny that student access or you bully and you harass that student access, you harass that student and you do not allow them access because of their identity, of their cultural, ethnic, and religious identity, that is racism. That is a civil rights issue. So that's why I think that was so important. And in the second case, um, and I'll be a little bit briefer because I know we're short on, on time as well, was the case that we also settled with the National Lawyers Guild. We sued the guild for enacting and carrying out a so-called BDS resolution. What the resolution really did was call on its members to engage in illegal discrimination in the commercial place based on the national origin of the other party. So for example, if I were to say, I have a problem with the Chinese government, therefore I'm gonna discriminate against you because you're Chinese and not do business with you, that is bigotry. That is illegal commercial discrimination. If I have a problem with Iranian nuclear disarmament, 
but then I refuse entrance to a person because they're Muslim into my business establishment, that is bigotry. So if you have a problem with the alleged crimes of a, a foreign Israeli government of which a regular Israeli person or an American Jew has no control over, but you're projecting the crimes against that person because of their ethnic identity or their national origin, that too is commercial discrimination. So we were able, we sued National Lawyers Guild for advocating and engaging in that commercial discrimination. And we settled the case, forcing the guild to enact a policy that denounces and specifically prevents its members from engaging in so-called BDS, but also force them to do business with our client, uh, Bibliotechnica, which is a company based in Israel. So I'd say those were the two most important cases for us in 2020. Amazing. Amazing. What's Rabbi Lifter, you look like you have a question. Oh, fa fantastic, Brooke. You, you, my, the information you give us, incredible. Thank you. I, I was just wondering if you had a take um, over the past couple of months where we've seen Israel engage in various peace treaties with Arab countries um, and how those treaties might impact civil rights of Jews uh, throughout the world. Well, I think it's really remarkable. Uh, first of all, the the I wouldn't call it irony. I'm not sure what the word is, but you know, at the same time, we are witnessing the most horrible type of anti-Jewish discrimination rear its ugly head in Europe again. And whereas Europe can't bring itself to uh, properly label products from Israeli citizens living in Judea and Samaria. They have the, the chutzpah to say that a Jew living in the Jewish homeland is illegal and want to discriminate and label Jewish products. On the other hand, the Muslim world is engaging in incredible peace treaties and economic treaties, which I think are so key because the further the economic interdependence between the peoples, I believe the less chance of any type of violent conflict. Because when the peoples are, are uh, dependent on each other for putting food on the table, for making money, you're, you're less likely to, to engage in conflict. Um, and yet Europe has not learned its lesson. So I am very inspired by what's happening in the Middle East right now. And I know that you know just being here in Israel, the mood and all the people who are now traveling to Dubai and they're, they're traveling to the Emirates and everybody's just so excited um, for this cultural exchange. And it's also spurred a lot of other cultural exchanges. For example, uh, the Lawfare Project is deeply involved with a, an organization called Chess for All which held the first sporting tournament, the first chess tournament between Israel and Morocco just a couple weeks ago, where children from the two countries played chess together. And next week we are sponsoring the first ever sporting competition between the, the nation of Bhutan and Israel. Um, and Bhutanese and, Is and Israeli children will be playing chess online together. And I think it's this type of cultural, cross-cultural exchange that uh, is, is beautiful and inspiring and, and really, you know, makes me happy when I think about it. Amazing thing. Brooke, how are you managing uh, to coordinate the Lawfare Project, living in Israel, different time zones, you know, not physically present uh, here in the United States? How's that, how's that all going? It's going very well, thank God. I think that one of the, I hate to use the phrase silver lining because COVID has been such a, a terrible thing and so many innocent lives have been lost. But what has happened, and I think we recognize it right here, is this online exchange, whether it's online learning or online conferences. And now my entire office is virtual. We've even been doing court uh, appearances over Skype, over conference call. So it's possible. And as a mother of three young children under the age of six, I love being in a time zone that's ahead. I love that Sunday is a work day here, first of all, because I get so much done. And then when I put my kids to sleep, um, I'm able to stay up sometimes till one o'clock in the morning to my husband's chagrin, but being right on time with, with East Coast. And it works very, very well, actually. No, oh, that's an amazing thing. Where Where is the Lawfare Project going in 2021? 
So I think that we are growing steadily. Um, right now, the simple truth is that there is much more demand for our services than we actually have the capacity to fulfill, uh, which is tragic because that means that there's a hell of a lot of anti-Jewish discrimination happening. But at the same time, thank God, uh, our donors are recognized this. They've really stepped up. I think the Jewish community is now recognizing the need for a serious legal offensive the time for writing letters and complaining and telling people how very angry we are is over. The time for action is now. And there is nothing more empowering than training our children in civil rights advocacy and enabling for our plaintiffs, for our clients to pursue justice. And this is not justice just for our client because the precedent that a seminal civil rights case sets benefits not just our minority community, but all minority communities. I mean, if you think about it, the beauty of a democracy is that we achieve change through the legislative and legal systems. All of the human rights and the civil rights that people celebrate, especially on, on the left, Roe v. Wade, for example, Brown v. Board of Education, the desegregation of schools, Roe v. Wade, the right that a woman has to her body. These are all products of seminal civil rights cases. And yet there has never been a Jewish civil rights movement in the diaspora. Okay, never. There's always been Jews advocating for LGBTQ rights, Jews for Black Lives Matter, Jews for women's rights, and so forth. There has never been a Jews for Jews movement. We've had a national liberation movement, that of Zionism, that establishes our right to self-sovereignty in Israel. But never here in America has there been a civil rights movement where Jews march and advocate for themselves as a minority community deserving of equal protection under the law. And that's why I'm also very excited to say that the Lawfare Project has joined with, I think, now 17 other organizations, over a dozen grassroots activists, social influencers in a new movement called End Jew Hatred, which is a true grassroots civil rights movement, which has two goals. Number one, to unify the Jewish community. Right now, we are very divided along partisan lines. I think this is a, a huge, huge mistake. Okay, there are Jews fighting against Jews in a partisan battle that frankly I have to say is not their battle. And the most important thing right now is to unify the Jewish community around the simple message that we must end Jew hatred now. And the second goal is to ensure there are real consequences, legal, political, social, other consequences for expression of anti-Jewish discrimination. And that's what the movement End Jew Hatred is all about. Sounds like you have a lot on your plate coming up. If somebody and, wanted to find out more about the Lawfare Project, how would they do that? I would encourage them to go to our website. It's thelawfareproject.org. And I would also encourage everyone to check out endjewhatred.com. Anybody can be a part of this movement. It's a grassroots civil rights Jewish liberation movement. We've had many marches and a lot of success. Um, I'm sure you heard about some of it when we were able to deplatform Leila Khaled, the notorious PFLB terrorist from Zoom. Uh, we marched outside the Grove demanding an end to Jew hatred on the UC campuses. And just recently, we had a, a action, a protest outside of Jack Dorsey's home, who is the CEO of Twitter, which made uh, headlines, national headlines, was covered on Fox News and all the major uh, Jewish newspapers, demanding an end to Jew hatred on Twitter. And I just want to be clear. I think what's happening right now in terms of big tech censorship is the greatest threat to the greatest democracy this world has ever seen. Okay, the only people that benefit from censorship of the marketplace of ideas and the stifling of different ideas are those who believe in fascism and communism and dictatorships. However, if there are big tech companies that are engaged in this type of massive censorship and at the same time are allowing Jew hatred, Holocaust denial, incitement to violence, incitement to genocide, targeting Jews to flourish, this is wrong. Twitter has 330 million active users a month. The population of the entire country of Germany during Nazi times was 86 million. 
This is over three times the population, and they are stifling one type of speech, whether you agree it or not, and allowing the proliferation of an extraordinarily dangerous amount of incitement to violence against the Jewish people. So if you'd like to join us in these protests, if you'd like to make your voice heard, if you want to be a part of the grassroots movement for Jewish liberation, please go to endjewhatred.com and check us out. Oh, amazing. Amazing. I think it's something that we all need to do. Uh, Brooke, we know that your time is limited and we're really very grateful uh, this morning that you made the time for us. We're grateful that you brought your passion uh, along with you where we stand in awe of your, uh, of your accomplishments and we wish you luck in your new home in Tel Aviv. Uh, and Amir you. Hashem, you should, be an, you should be an inspiration for all of us. Thank you. We will definitely be back to the United States. I love the United States of America, um, and I will do everything in my power to continue to advocate for freedom and an absence of anti-Jewish discrimination in America. But I have to say, it feels real good to be in Israel right now. And what an incredible honor to be invited to talk to this storied, wonderful synagogue that I've really been looking forward to connecting with for a long time. So thank you so much for having me. And I think we just had a blackout. <laughs> There's a storm happening here, by the way. Welcome to Israel. <laughs> Everybody says that. Everything that happens, welcome to Israel. Welcome. That's right. Thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to continuing to be in touch with you. And we look forward, even more importantly, to the success of the Lawfare Project and NJewHatred.com also. Thanks Thank for joining Thank you, Brooke. Wow. Ooh. Amazing. About having a lot on your plate. Glad she's on our side. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Very glad she's yeah. on our side. It just sounds like she has more passion at the end of the day than I have anywhere else during the day. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's actually pretty, it's pretty incredible because I know in my house we've been uh, busy with uh, getting the kids uh, – through their schoolwork and particularly now with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day tomorrow, um, schools are really, you know, trying to educate kids about civil rights and, and equality and, and potential discrimination. So it's uh, really rings very true to, uh, to really, to today, to today, to, to this week. It's uh, as appropriate as ever. And uh, it's interesting that, you know, we need to look a little bit closer to home sometimes. I think that we're, you know, we're living in this really, tinderbox explosive kind of environment um I, I had the chance this past week to be on a you know a uh, a zoom uh group i don't know a zoom group talking about the incident that happened at the north Shore hebrew academy and the you know the hijacking of the website and the uh the anti-semitism that was there and we're we're literally sitting on a powder keg and and you know what she what brooke is ad is advising us to do you know what she's advocating for is i think very crucial very important for us we don't do enough of it you know that other minorities do and we always say uh you know when are we going to learn from them but uh clearly there's something there's something to be learned here speaking yeah. of learning speaking of learning um we are now the 12th day of 2021 not that not that we're celebrating the beginning per se, but um, 2021 gives us a chance to reflect back on 2020. So um, so I have a question for each of us. Uh, we'll start with you guys since I'm doing all the talking and I'm gonna get off here. My wife is gonna say, I can't believe you'd let them, you did all the talking and didn't let anybody else talk. Um, what what lesson or two lessons would you take from, would you take from 2020? I know, Chazen, you uh, you posted something on your, uh, was it Facebook? Um, um, yeah. Facebook. What'd you say? Um, I said that 2020 was, it was really easy to focus on the negativity because there were so many missed opportunities for so many people. Um, opportunities in family, visiting and business and travel um, and so many other different angles that people really lost out on. But I saw a lot of new opportunities as well, um, connecting with people in ways that I haven't connected with them before. You know, it's like you, you visit people and you get used to seeing people, but the people who you 
don't see regularly, they kind of get pushed to the back a little bit. But now everyone was uh, equally accessible through emails and through um, Zoom and Facebook and social media, the same way you could reach out to the person who you would have seen otherwise in person, now you're reaching out uh, online and digitally, you can reach out to anyone the same way. And so it was really a great opportunity to reconnect with people in a way that I hadn't for, for many years, which uh, I found to be very positive. And even on, on the business side of things, being able to collaborate with people because all of a sudden this was the best option was to connect with someone digitally. So if it meant um, in my own personal work doing a, a recording session with musicians that uh, I otherwise would not have had access to because they were busy traveling the world, all of a sudden they couldn't and we were able to connect with them. So it really, it gave us a, a new focus a little bit, it gave me a new focus at least, being able to spend more time with my own my own family, my wife and my kids was really, really special. Um, eating way too much food was uh, was great, I have to say. Donuts, right? Those, gosh, those sufkani. You, I, I'm still full from yeah. watching you eat that. Uh, I'm still full after eating that. Um, yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I felt that, that 2020 kind of passed us by and everyone was talking about how much they were looking forward to it ending and getting into 2021. And that's a, it's, it's nice to look forward to the future and to change and to potential. But I think there was too much negativity that was surrounding the closing days of December. And I just wanted to breathe a little bit of life into it. I don't, I don't like to delve on the negativity. I don't think that's very, very prosperous. I don't think it's very profitable. But if you move to a little bit of uh, optimism and hopefully you can carry that forward, then in retrospect, 2020 maybe wasn't as bad as we all made it out to be. And hopefully we can capitalize on that and grow. Nice. That, that's what I was looking for. Good lesson. Good post. A nice message. Lichter, what was 2020 for you? Uh, I'll just pick up where 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 Hazen uh, left off. I I also felt as the the days of 2020 were closing, you know whether people kind of just felt as if you know it it they were subject to the year 2020 and now 2021 they're hoping for better things and i think we we lose sight of the fact sometimes that we can um i think impose our will is a little bit too strong a term but we can make things different for us um and, and we don't always have to be subject to the the ills and and difficulties of life as much as we think uh that we are subject to them and i think Getting together, whether it be in shul or whether it be in safe ways, um, or just really taking taking projects upon ourselves and and making them, giving them structure, is something that uh, brings a little bit more life um, to to the daily grind. I know for for our family that that family unit was so impactful for me. For for really, Katie, our our children it allowed us to like slow down a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes we're just, whether it's during the week, you think of all types of extracurricular stuff and sporting events and all, and you're running from one to the next. And as these things happen, you don't get a chance almost to digest what just occurred. And so I think that allowed us to, to do that. And it was, um, with, with all the craziness that happened, we missed our parents. Um, but, um, you know, we, we were able to, to find, uh, more things to talk about. It's funny, we were just at the Shabbos table. I'll, I'll give you one idea where, as it was, we were talking about our family's history. Um, I think the kids, you know, they, they they pipe up and they hear a lot more at the Shabbos tables when we start talking about what life was like before they existed. Um, and they're always interested in it. And to tell that part of the family story and how they fit into it um, always, always creates a, a great bond. So that's what we're... Part of things we did. That's it. That's How about for you? How about for you? What was 2020? So, um, so look, I think I think 2020 was difficult, and I think we have to, you know, I I feel very I feel that I have to be very careful in saying it wasn't difficult. We lost some, you know, we lost some great members of our show, uh, great members of our community during 2020 to this uh, vicious pandemic, and you know, I, I so so I don't I don't want to whitewash 2020. Um, but I think for me, it was like pushing a reset button. Uh, maybe that's a little bit what Rabbi Lichter was referring to. And I was like, I push a reset button. I certainly pushed a reset button with my davening. Um, you know, so during those, uh, you know, during those Shabbosos where we couldn't be in shul, 
um, it, it was, you know, my, my davening was at a whole different level. And unfortunately, it, it sometimes is in show. That was like a reset button for me. Um, you know, a reset button of, you know, setting priorities. Uh, a reset button of reconnecting with family. So I, I sort of look at 2020 as a as a reset button, um, and and maybe to emphasize, you know, some of the some of the things that I took for granted before then. Um, you know, it was it was a hard year for me. You know, with my mother passing away, and uh, and you know, realizing that I didn't get the amount of time that I would have liked or that I should have liked to have spent with her. Um, you know, and now COVID is sort of making that more difficult, even with my father. So, you know, so it's it, it's sort of like, uh, you know, highlighted those those elements for uh, for me. And I, I'm sure the people who are, uh, you know, who are watching us have their own insight into into 2020. I don't know. Anybody want to share uh, an insight? Just put it up. How's a spinner? How do they do that? What do they do? They throw it up on the chat? Issue comments in uh, whichever way they're watching on, on Facebook or on uh, on YouTube. They can post their comments. We'll be happy to share them here. Okay, that's great. I do wonder going forward if 2020 is going to be that year that we're either going to keep referencing as like that that moment of change, that moment of of pivot, or if it's the year that we just don't want to talk about. Right? Where where is it? Where is it going to be in you know 10 years from now? How is 2020 going to feel? And I just uh, it's it's really hard really hard to predict very very challenging and and in 20 and 10 years from now you know what are our children and our i mean for me our grandchildren going to remember from 2020 you know is that is that oh when we used to go to school in masks you know or or we couldn't you know we couldn't hang out with each other or is there is there more that's there i great it's a great question there, there's going to be a point I hope it ends with 2020 <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes I, there's going to be a point when when each of us is going to reach into a, a coat or a jacket pocket that we haven't reached into in a while. And we're just going to feel that mask in there. And it's going to bring back all those memories of uh, always keeping a mask handy and not being able to walk into shul or the grocery store or, or anywhere for that matter with that mask. It's just uh, it's going to be a while before these masks disappear from our lives, even if they disappear from our public lives, but before we empty our pockets. I, I think it's going to take me the entire 2021 to get all the masks, find them in my car. Because <laughs> they're all, they're all you know, the glove compartment, the side box, a little, little thing be, here. It should be renamed the mask compartment. <laughs> I have to tell you, after I'm finished with my mask after a day, it is so sweated, wet, and, and I just throw it right out. I, I don't want to leave it anywhere in a pocket in my car. It is as far away from me as possible. You know, it's, 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 it's not bad. Sorry. The mitzvah to burn it with the chametz. Amen. Okay, great. Good. Yeah. I, I I'll see tell you one thing. Question one Werber. I, I didn't see that. Oh, what was that? Oh, wait. Uh, oh, yeah. Marty asked the question. Marty, we'll have to uh, we'll have to get back to Brooke on that and see uh, you know see what her answer is. We'll share that with you. Absolutely. I didn't see any, I didn't see any other questions that were there. Um, okay. Good to have everybody with us. You guys have anything else you want to share? Uh, I just want to say that uh, talking to our great neck friends here. Um, one of the things that I was able to do in 2020 and get more involved with in in my own side projects that really I never saw coming was these virtual gala. Um, I don't want to call them dinners because not everybody's eating, but these these virtual broadcasts. I I did some really really cool projects with some really fantastic organizations, and we've got one of our own coming up, which is it's really very cool to see how it's all coming together. Very different than anything we've ever done in the past. Um, I know people, I know firsthand people are working very hard on that and they deserve uh, a lot of credit for all the work and, and volunteering that they're doing. And I'm looking forward to a very unique way to, to highlight someone who we've been working with um, for, for a number of years, you guys for longer than me, but uh, it's, it's such a cool platform. It's a really so good platform. Us, say, how, how does this work? Like what's going to happen? I mean, so, it's great for honoring Rabbi Shalom and Oksana Jensen as well as the the heroes of first responders uh, and our medical profession at this upcoming gala, but, but like, what's going to happen? Is am I going to get a corned beef sandwich, you know, delivered through the computer? How's this going to work? That's a very good question. Um, some details are still. Yes. 
<laughs> we will email it to you. Um, some details uh, are still in the works. Some details I don't even know about because I'm not involved on that end. Um, I'm actually involved uh, not as much as, as many other people. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that, but I know that this is one of those things that if 2020 hadn't taken its, its course, we would never have been able to create a broadcast like this. And for better or for worse, organizations are raising a lot more money than they ever did. And they're spending a lot less money to produce their events. So the net gain for, for many is really a tremendous, tremendous thing. And who knows, you know, what would have been if not for the challenges of 2020. So it's, it's one of the positives a, that I'd like to- great point. Like to It's on. a great point. You know, I actually think that the website, the evite, there was an evite sent out this morning. Did you guys get that evite yet? Uh, check your email this morning. Uh, uh, I believe I was. I got it. Right. Were ten thirty this morning. Ten thirty this morning. Good. Right in the middle of our broadcast, there was an evite sent out <laughs> um, for the dinner for to register for this gala. Right. We shouldn't call it a dinner. This uh, gala celebration and recognition of uh, the Jensens. So I want to encourage everyone to check their email and to register. Uh, for the upcoming gala, and thank you to all of the hard people who, all of the people who are working so hard on this. I know, I know uh, across the board. You know, you guys know this personally. Uh, you got it going on in your family. So, uh, so thank, thank everybody for their hard work for this. Rabbi, you still have coffee in your cup? Uh, actually, it's time for more coffee. I had a devastating moment this past week, um, where I reached for another sip of coffee, and it was already empty. And I, I, it was, it was heartbreaking. It was really heartbreaking. Listen, how, how can you're not drinking out of one of your small cups. That's a, that's for espresso. Okay. This is not. This is a double lungo. Um, <laughs> sounds like you shouldn't be able to say that on a broadcast. That's right. It, it sounds like you should be taller to say double lungo. I don't know. I'm sorry. It's, a, it's a double lungo, and it's fantastic. But you need a, you need a normal size. So I went. I went this morning to make myself a cup of coffee. I don't. I don't make fancy coffee like you, Chazen. You know, I just put the instant in a cup. And for some reason, and I've yet had the opportunity to ask her. My wife took the coffee out of the, out of the, coffee jar that it comes in and put it into glass jars. And I'm like, wait a second, is this still coffee? You're like, what's going on here? It's very fancy. It's, it's story, coffee, but I'm not sure what happened with that. I have to remind me to ask her and see. You don't know if it's regular or decaf. Oh, we don't until you know. an hour later. Actually, we don't we don't have decaf in the house. I don't oh. consider decaf regular coffee. I don't consider decaf coffee. So, Understood. all right. Hey, are we doing a perm spiel this year? Okay, we'll leave, we'll leave it for the next time we get together. That's a great. It's a great question. Don't ask it too loudly. I I didn't. Okay. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Chazen, thank you for hosting us all. Uh, by thank, Lichter, you. thank you for uh, for arranging for Brooke Goldstein to be with us. Uh, Brooke, if you're listening or if you're watching this afterwards, uh, we, we appreciated uh, the time that you gave us and what we learned from you, and we wish you continued good luck. All awesome. right. Everybody have I'm a great Sunday. Thank you for seeing everyone on the next episode. Yes. Have a great Sunday.